Hello and welcome to the Clock and Talk, an Arsenal podcast, and we're covering for fuck's sake. Good job, me and Schwinn are a lot more prepared than you, because if we came on and went, oh yeah, we didn't watch the game either, we was on the pit, it'd be a pretty shit podcast. Well, Mesut Ozil is the best number 10 in the Premier League. Yeah, that all looks good on paper, but there's never been a football match played on paper, so it's not really worth much. I'm going to make a bold prediction that Jack Wilshere will sign for West Ham United. It's time to start watching football with your eyes. I think people listen to what the commentator is saying and have that as their own opinion, but if you watch what's going on, you'll see things a lot clearer. Schwinn, who do you think is going to win the Golden Boot? I think Alexis Sanchez might do a number on that this year. <laughs> yeah, okay. Tony talks about a clock being right twice a day. Tez is right every day. Try it from five, lads. Fucking beauty! Hello and welcome to the Clock End Talk, an Arsenal podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you for downloading. You follow us at Clock End underscore talk. We're on all good podcast apps, YouTube, Facebook, and everywhere else you can listen to. Um, look, it's we've, we've jumped up and we've decided to do a podcast and we thought we'd get into your ears. Um, we, we were struggling for a bit of content and thinking what can we come up with and somebody suggested we'll do a cricket podcast. Well, I can assure you, we're not talking cricket here today. Um, <laughs> so I got Schwinn on board and said, hey, let's uh, do a Guna to Guna podcast. We've actually um, coming into our third season next season, this podcast, and We've got over 100,000 downloads, so thank you everybody for, for your support and listens and everything. But we actually, sat, as I sat back and thought about that, I thought, do you actually know who we are and what we are all about? Obviously you know that I like Granite Xhaka and Schwinn likes Ozil and Tony's still having a sook over Jack Wilshere leaving and, <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know all that, but... Do you actually know who I am? Do you know who Schwinn is? And when Tony comes back with us, because he's travelling to Baku, so when he comes back, we'll also get him on. So anyway, let's get into it. And uh, welcome, Schwinn. How are you, buddy? Uh, wait, is this not a cricket podcast? Have I come on to the wrong show? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was fully expecting to discuss the World Cup and how India is going to win it. I'm not even going to discuss cricket, mate. <laughs> Australian cricket team is an absolute <laughs> fucking shit fight at the moment, so I'm not interested in cricket. I haven't been interested in cricket since Alan Border retired, and that was a long time ago. <laughs> so. well, well, that's great, because my cricket knowledge ended with everything I just said in my previous statement, so that's wonderful. We can move on forward. <laughs> sounds good, sounds good. <laughs> okay, so, um, and as I said in the introduction, mate, we're going to do a Guna to Guna podcast. We're going to let people who listen to us and who have supported us um, learn about us, I suppose, and, and who we are and what we are and what our favourite players were and who we disliked and all, all, all that for, for Arsenal. So, uh, mate, I'll start off. Who, who are you? Um, I am an individual who is 26 years old. I grew up in India. I was born here, of course. And I moved abroad, uh, I moved to the U.S. for my studies uh, when I finished school here. Uh, of course, I ended up working there for a few years in a, in a variety of different capacities at different levels. And having quit my job last year, I took a gap year to sort of explore other, other things, what I wanted to do in life uh, from, you know, from then on. And I've decided to pursue uh, further education for the time being. So before that starts, I'm traveling around, meeting some friends that I haven't seen in a few years because of other responsibilities uh, seeing some places that I haven't been to, you know, just just taking time as it comes and and developing some extra skills uh, while I wait for school to start. So that's 26 years summed up in 26 seconds. I hope. But tell us a bit more about yourself, Tez. <laughs> um, well, obviously, yeah, born and bred in Australia. I'm a Indigenous Australian. Um, look, I. Uh, who am I? I suppose I'm um, I'm I'm actually an operations manager for a large security firm. In Australia, I uh, own two businesses because I also do. Um, also, am a DJ as well, believe it or not. Um, so wherever I can make a dollar, you'll see me trying to make that dollar. Um, basically, yeah, I, 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 you know, obviously went to school and all that shit. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go to year twelve. I didn't go to university or anything. Um, 
I decided to get out as soon as I can and uh, earn a dollar. I'm actually a tradesman by a tradesman in a uh, plumber by trade. Um, I got in the security industry by sheer accident uh, because the trades weren't doing that well at the time. And I, a bloke said, "You interested? You big beefy bloke like you be good at security?" So, uh, what 20 years on, and yeah, I've still been doing it the, the same thing. I've uh, covered things from IT security to uh, manpower to everything in, in, you know, doing with security is pretty much is, is my I suppose. So would you have gone to uni if Australia actually had universities or was that just a decision not to? <laughs> uh, mate, my family business, <laughs> I know you're taking a the piss there, um, but the family business was actually a, a, a plumbing business and you just do your schooling and you leave school and become the family business, so... That was pretty much what I what I did. Was I, I got rushed off to the family business as soon as I was old enough to, and I did five years with it. And um, let me tell you, working with family and going into business with family <laughs> is not a good thing. <laughs> big no, big no. It was, it was five years of absolute hell, but I got through it and um, couldn't wait to get out of it. So, so. So, so tell me, Ted, someone who is you know some who's born in Australia, born and bred there, as you said. Uh, indigenous to the land uh, and has had so many responsibilities as a young young human being you know as a young man you have the business to look after you obviously don't have the exposure of going to a university meeting people from different backgrounds or different countries possibly uh, how did you fall in love with the arsenal what was the story behind that <laughs> it's actually a funny story oh well you might think it's funny but I do now because I I, I could have been a Newcastle United fan <laughs> um because of the Knights? Don't say because of the Knights. Uh, well, I obviously, I follow Newcastle Knights and, yeah, look, Newcastle, Newcastle, that's, type of, that's where, you know, I, I probably should have ended up. But I, when I, when I look for a team, because obviously we've got no connection to a team, like our, our, our grandfather's, not like Tony who, you know, he probably had family and whatnot. Um, coming up the time, but 1992 the Premier League started and Australia was a little bit behind when it came to pay TV rights and things. We had it on pay TV, but those who could afford it could watch it and to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning back in 92 to watch a, uh, a game of football was just unheard of. Like, who gets up at 2am in the morning to watch sports? <laughs> uh, so I was obviously a big rugby league um, my family was big rugby, rugby league backing. Uh, we all followed rugby league and whatnot. So Newcastle was was type of where I was probably thinking when I got into the Premier League. Um, now I I when I look for a team because I've got no connections to it, I research the absolute fucking hell out of that team, <laughs> mm. and and I look through every single team from from the top from Manchester United, Liverpool, Chelsea to everywhere. To what connection uh, do I have to a team? Obviously, Newcastle was going to be one of them ones that was going to be pretty big because of Newcastle. Uh, Newcastle Knights, the rugby league team I follow, but I actually liked Arsene Wenger. Um, mm. I just, for me, I just, he was an absolute genius. Uh, they, you know, how we moved from Highbury to the Emirates, and he kept us consistently at top four level and that had a major appeal for me mm. uh, you know like as well as the you know you could go through the background from from the way Arsenal started out um, uh, you know on the on the back of a, a couple of blokes working working at the armatory and and decided to start a football team that just had a, a really big appeal for me because I could I could relate to and and I could be totally wrong like and I apologise to people uh, who live in the UK and whatnot, but it felt like they were battlers, and mm. they were workers who who were working out of the armatory. And for me, I'm, I I I could relate to that. Um, uh, that's that's probably how I'd be obviously how and that's so so Arsenal was the way, what I chose. Yeah, I mean, f football always sort of has been uh, a blue-collar sport in a lot of those regards. That's why we've seen, you know, the dominant centers of football away from capital cities. You know, Manchester, of course, being a big one. And, and it sort of resonates throughout Europe. Uh, but, but Arsenal is different in that regard. And I sort of agree with you that there, there is that workman spirit 
uh, maybe not anymore or to the extent we want it in today's world, but um, particularly if you look behind to George, the George Graham era, era, which was you know just before my era, I think ever since that, that that's been inculcated into you know with our identity back then. And one nil to the Arsenal obviously is pretty much infamous because of that reason. Because once we score, then there's no way you're getting in, and that is basically a result of you know direct hard work. I'll just touch quickly because a lot of people also who follow me on Twitter and you can follow us at, at Gunatez or something. I am. I can't remember what it is. But um, a lot of people who follow me, they also know I'm a Roma fan. And I often get the question of, why do you follow Roma? Before 1992, I was a young, young strapping lad in high school. And the Italian, uh, Italian league was a really, really big league back before the Premier League. It, it was all, everybody talked about the Italian league. And mm. over here, you'd have, it was called Wogball. Um, I don't know if it probably was in other other countries as well. I'm, I'm not sure, but but uh, little bloody Charles or something, he'd, he'd be the little wog. You'd you'd say, hey, what was the scores in the football this week, buddy? And he'd yell out, oh, Roma and Juventus, and 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 you know he'd yell out the scores to you. You type of found yourself following the game through him telling you the scores. As 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 crazy as that sounds, we're talking, mate. We had no internet. Um, mm. No form of technology to, to look on a mobile phone and look at the scores. Um, you, you'd read it in the paper. You, you'd watch a weekly highlight show on SBS once a week. Um, and, and that's how your type of got your football. And so everybody followed um, AC Milan back then. Of course. I, I said, I, I'm not going to follow. I'm not a sheep. I, I don't follow people. Um, so once again, I... I, I, I at the time I, I don't know how I come up with Roma, but I think it was more the logo stuff because I wouldn't have researched back in then because there was nothing to research on. Uh, so it was more than likely I just went, look, I'm going for Roma. <laughs> so that, I actually become a, I was actually a Roma fan before I was an Arsenal fan. So d- does that mean that if Roma are playing Arsenal, whether it's a friendly or you know, for the sake of argument, the Champions League final, you'd be supporting Roma? Uh, <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, I, I'm, my heart is more Arsenal, though. As, as I, I know it should be more Roma because I've been following Roma a lot longer. But once again, we, we were only living through Charlie the Italian for our for mm. our. For our our scores and things. We weren't, we weren't watching the games. We weren't listening to it on a radio. We didn't, just didn't have it. Didn't have access to it. So, when the Premier League came in in 1992, I think I started. Uh, and, and look, don't quote me on dates and stuff. But I think it was the, might have been year 2000, 2001, mm. where I where I actually started watching a lot of Premier League football. Um, because I think I moved out on my own, and I actually got Foxtel, and could af- yeah, and I could afford Foxtel, and and got it, um, and that's when I used to sit up at two o'clock in the morning and all these crazy hours watching watching football. And still, then it was people would go, "You're fucking crazy, man! Like you're up watching football at or, or soccer is what it was known as at, at this stupid hour of the day. <laughs> Why are you fucking? Are you off your fucking head?" Uh, so I, I probably watched a lot more of Arsenal in them early days, even though I was following Roma prior to that. But I was only really following Roma through Charlie and his scores. Mm. Yeah, so that, that bond probably never got established, you know, and definitely not at the rate at which it was established with the Arsenal. So uh, I think your heart is in the right place, my friend. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's interesting how far we've come, you know, 2019. Like, I'm talking back 2000, 2001, 92. You know, like it doesn't seem that long ago. Um, but the, the technology that has come in the last 20 years, would people wouldn't know. Like, like I don't know if you're, you're, what your circumstances were, and I'll, I'll discuss that with you as well, but I don't know if people realise that how far we've actually come to since 1992 and how far the actual Premier League has come worldwide. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, and the, I mean, the leap is gigantic. I mean, you say the last 19, 20 years. Uh, I, I, I'd say in the last 10 years itself, the 
the rate at which technological advancement has happened and by definition the you know the access the average consumer has is incredible you know from from a time when you're getting information from a mate like Charlie who's you know giving you information on on your team to sitting in your room now with four or five different screens one on a laptop on a on an iPad on a phone on a television and you can have all different games on and keep up with exactly what's happening in a different corner of the globe mm-hmm. Uh, so Arsenal, why, why Arsenal for you? Uh, I, I think I've spoken about this on the podcast before, so I'll just go go over it briefly. I was visiting the uh, the UK back when I was five or six years old, very very young, formative years. Uh, growing up in India, I was obviously a big cricket fan, and when we visited the UK, it so happened that India was touring um, uh, England at that point, and they were playing a few games across the country, Birmingham. Uh, London, there was a game at scheduled at Lords, I believe, and it so happened that the game, the day the game was supposed to be played at Lords, uh, it rained out, and we couldn't make it to the game. So, as an alternative, we ended up going for an Arsenal game. Uh, my cousins, who used to live back in the UK back then, were season ticket holders, and we didn't have to really pull any strings to get tickets. Uh, walked into Highbury back then and and watched us play against Leeds, and ever since I stopped watch, watching cricket altogether and. Just basically got married to the sport and to the arsenal. So, what was it like as a as a as a young whipping bloke like yourself? You, you go back to India and you, you you know you've said, oh, I've gone and watched a Premier League game. This Arsenal, they're, they're unbelievable. And, and India's huge on cricket. Like, what was your reaction? What was your friend's reaction when when you went back and all of a sudden I'm not following cricket no more. I'm following football. I mean, I think it's very important to put in context, just as you did, because I didn't understand the concept of the Premier League. I didn't understand what a league is. I didn't understand how people win. The, the math, you know, simple maths like three points for a win, uh, one for a draw, nil for a loss, didn't quite make sense to me because of how young I was. I didn't understand the format. My only exposure to the sport was literally 90 minutes of the sport being played out. And I realized that this fast-paced nature of a sport is what I tend to enjoy without there being, you know, commercials or breaks after every over in cricket, for example. So it was it was a very alien thing that I had witnessed, and and that's what I told my my buddies, my friends, my family, who I ended up interacting with afterwards. And the the transition wasn't from watching Indian cricket to watching British Premier League football. The transition was was from watching cricket to football. That was it. And, you know, I started playing football afterwards, ended up actually playing quite a bit in my life uh, as I was growing up. And cricket was just something that was put on the back burner and never eventually tended to. I I think the urban youth in India, to answer your question directly, is very permeable when it comes to these things. Uh, We we, want to know more things. We want to experience different things in life. And when things are made accessible, you know, people tend to to try them out and, and you know, more often than not enjoy them. Football probably is the easiest sport to to play with, you know, when it comes to makeshift tools. You can just get a, a ball, put two bags or two shoes, and you have a goalpost. Cricket has a bit more stuff to it. You have to arrange a bat, a ball, uh, maybe even some, something to replicate wickets. And football, that, that regard, is a, a bit more uh, pedestrian, one could argue, for lack of a better word. And it, it's what the masses have always enjoyed, you know, so, sort of ties in with the, the blue-collar argument I made earlier. So it, football always has been popular in, in this, you know, the south of India in certain parts. But now if you look across uh, North India, you'll, you'll see football grounds, you'll see billboards, uh, you know, popular footballers all over them. Uh, even in pop culture, you'll hear football references. So it's, it, it, it's, it's, we're at that, at that point where football is a part of culture in India, despite cricket, cricket being the religion in the country. There's enough people in this country, you know, for, to have a big fan following for another sport altogether you you talk about you know you watch the game how, how do you watch how did you watch the game and you get your results when you're back in india what were, were you like similar to us with pay tv and um they, they broadcast it there absolutely um uh, i i don't think i remember watching a game of football um on tv before the 2000s before the turn of the century uh thankfully though um Arsenal obviously were in their prime, if not reaching their prime back then, uh, as as the decade, as the millennia was turning. And it's just so happened that every time football was telecasted, Arsenal was on TV. You know, we didn't have to look through different channels to find them. If a a channel was showing football, they would be showing the Arsenal. So it was easily accessible back, you know, that way. But 
I mean, as you remember, we didn't really have many channels back then. You know, maybe had two sports channels along with the local one that only aired, you know, domestic stuff. So accessibility was a problem. You had to sift through newspapers in, you know, at the turn of the week to check up when the next game is because you didn't have the internet to check, you know, when the next fixture is, what time it is. So you had to do all that and you had to prepare in advance. And, you know, it, 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 there were simpler times, but the, the excitement level was pretty much the same, I'd say. Did you, um, so, so when you, you're obviously back watching stuff, did you, were you ever, like, because you were obviously, obviously watched uh, Arsenal at Highbury, were you ever contemplating another team? Like, I'd imagine, because I, I, I vaguely remember Manchester United were huge in merchandise in Australia uh, back when I was a kid, you know, you, and when I say huge, you, you were getting free bags with a bloody bottle of Coke of Manchester United. You know, you'd go to the show and there'd be a Manchester United show bag and there was no Arsenal or, or no other team. That did you Were you almost like Manchester United? Were they big over there in India? Massive, massive. As, as I'm sure any one of our listeners listening right now, they're probably nodding their heads. Irrespective of which part of the world they live in, they'd be nodding their heads that yes, they were. And I think more than the soft power that you mentioned, it was the peer pressure. You know, all of my buddies that I grew up with, my childhood friends who I'm still very close to, all of them lads, other than one guy, all support Manchester United. And, you know, that was the group you had to battle with. And as a, in your youth, when, you know, you are obviously a bit more prone to, to say certain things, do certain things that you won't do as a grown man, uh, especially back then when, uh, you know, correct and appropriate speech didn't exist, you'd hear things, you know, the banter would get real. Uh, we had a lot of tough fixtures against United. And during those times, even during those times, it was, uh, you know, the banter would get violent at times, obviously not, aggra- not, not physically, but in terms of verbatim, it, it was obviously very, very palpable. So that pressure has always been there. And I sort of enjoyed it. I think it made me love Arsenal even more because it proactively made me think about arguments against Man United fans. So it sort of reinforced my emotion and what I felt about the club because I truly do believe that what you know what really attracts you to a club is not necessarily just the football. It's obviously a big part of it, but you know, as the cliched saying goes, that I found I found a sense of belonging. As you said, you know, as you you got attracted and attached to a club that you never watched ever play but because of this bond that you sort of created you know there was a a feeling a distinct feeling that you couldn't let go and that's exactly how it was for me just in a bit more hostile environment I suppose okay so um uh, this look we're we're obviously going to go on what we know um so I'm I'm talking probably me back in 2000s who who is your favorite Arsenal player ever Ooh, um, I mean, there's obviously the you know the most obvious answers: Thierry Henry, Dennis Bergkamp, Patrick Vieira, Tony Adams. Although he was a bit before my time, if I'm perfectly honest, uh, at least his prime was. Um, but I, I think I'd I'll say Robert Perez. Um, he was the one that I it, you know just caught, like I, that's the first guy that sort of my eyes were following on the pitch as a young child. Uh, he seemed to be on it on the day, and, and I think that helped. Um, this was, of course, not the first game I watched. This was another game I watched in the future when Perez was actually at the club. And it, it's the first time that I sort of developed you know, a bond with a player in the pitch that I was watching live. And I, I knew that day that this guy is my favorite player. It's the first time I, wa- I walked out of an Arsenal game af- and, and bought a shirt. I've never done that before. It's usually before the game. But it's the first time I did that after a game, and I think that itself t- tells you the whole tale. What about you? Um, <laughs> for me, it was Tony Adams, and mm. I, I know it's it's not going to people are going to go like he's not the glory of the goal scoring machine as as a as a uh, you know Thierry Henry and a, a, a different players Burkamp and things like that. Look, they're all I love them. Thank you. I love all them players that you mentioned as well. Don't get me wrong. But for me, um, I, I looked up to him as a, as a leader, and, and that's exactly what he was. And, and on the pitch, he was uh, like just, just the ability to, 
to lead the team was just unbelievable. I, and and we talk about captains and we talk about born leaders and and I don't know I get a bit of a stiffy on <laughs> when, when, <laughs> when I'm here you know like just they take these players under their wing and and for and I'm going back to football back in when I when I started following we we, we didn't have Foxtel so you're reading in the paper Tony Adams leads his leads the Arsenal to to another win you know and it was all about tony adams leads the leads the team and and that's how the, the papers over here because that's that's all we'd get the information from so um so for me it just become a, a love fest for tony adams it's like wow this bloke's a real leader and and um so so i love that type of player uh, mm. more than the I, I love the glamour players as well but just the, just them leader type players and um, uh, uh, and and just uh, I don't want to get off subject for Arsenal, but Roma with Toddy, you know, he was that player. Mm. Um, played obviously a different position to, to Adams, but but once again, you, you know, when when you could read about it, it was Toddy leads Roma to victory, and I was like, yeah, fucking get that up, you, you cunts, you know, like it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was just yeah. So that's that's how I type of become. Uh, a Tony Adams fan, and then then when I watched him and that, and I was like, "Well, yeah." So, um, <laughs> who is your most disliked player ever? Oh, you know, I, I I remember you sharing this this list of questions with me, and this was the one that I struggled with the most. I I really don't think I have a disliked player, or you know, a player that I've hated at the club. Uh, maybe there is an obvious candidate that I'm missing out on, and 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 you can you know fill my memory in with that. Gosh, where's Tony when you need him? But I there's there's really no no one that comes to mind. You know, I mean, obviously there's this the the culprits that come to mind, the usual suspects, and Nasri, Fabregas, Van Persie. But sort of you know ha- having been told what really happened with those individual cases, other than Van Persie, I don't really quite have beef with anyone and even man Percy, not to the extent that you'd imagine you know mm. so there, there's really no one that i dislike uh, i'd say so i'm a little bit different you, different you in this answer because i was thinking about it and I, I, by all means this is this could come a bit controversial he's a brilliant signing <laughs> but his loyalty fucking stunk for me and mm. and and when i was look i'm gonna say soul campbell Brilliant player for the Arsenal. We got him for free. But it just stank. <laughs> um, I remember reading the headlines of, of Sol Campbell dumps dumps Tottenham for Arsenal and and it was the the media were talking about him um, uh, you know, being a Judas and, and whatnot. And, and it just as a young kid growing up, it was You'd look at it and think, "Oh, do is that right? Do you do that?" <laughs> like, I don't be wrong. He's a. He, I think he was a great signing for Arsenal because we, as I said, we got him for free. He's a great player for Arsenal, but he just that that little bit of bad taste in your mouth. Does that make sense? <laughs> I mean, I I, I can empathise um, with with someone saying that if they were a Tottenham fan, but. As an Arsenal fan, um, as, as I said, I can acknowledge that feeling. I understand that. But I don't feel it at all. You know, I, for, for me, uh, football has become cutthroat. It has been for a bit. And Sol was probably just maybe ahead of his time in that regard. You know, he went for personal glory. He went for professional success. And he realized that the quickest way to Europe or to do anything, you know, significant was just to hop on a train a mile away from White Hart Lane and, and start playing at, at Highbury. So I, I commend the man's courage. I think he was a good player for us. He obviously was a cult hero because of the way he came to the club. Uh, but I, as an Arsenal fan, I, I loved every second of, of what transpired. So I don't quite feel that. I've just read the question again. Who is your most disliked player? <laughs> I'm talking about you know loyalty and things, but it doesn't really come into that category of disliked player, does it? Right. Maybe the question was, who is a player that you dislike the most who is actually loved by the fan base? Yeah, yeah. look, I love him, but I hate him at the same time. Like, it's just, and, and it's not that, for me, loyalty's big. I, I, I'm really, um, 
It's just the type of person I am. And loyalty within my business, within everything that I do. Um, if you're going to jump ship because, and I know it's a cutthroat business, but if you're going to jump ship because you're getting a better dollar elsewhere, well, that just it just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. I, uh, even though I, d- I don't dislike you, but I, I just for me it's just a little bit of a dis dis taste in my mouth. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, I, I suppose a question to you would be that there's a very hot bird that that your enemy is dating and they dump their enemy and they start dating you. Would you be mad at that woman? I wouldn't go for it, though. That's where my, I am. I'd say I wouldn't. I would never, ever, uh, two, two, two rules. I'd never fuck a mate's missus after she broke up or they broke up. I would never date a mate's missus after they broke up or ever broke up. For me, it just, that's your mate's missus. It always is, always has been. Even though it broke up, even if it's 10 years down the track, that still was my mate's missus. But what if it's not your mate, it's your enemy? That's what I'm saying. Oh, my enemy? Yeah. Uh, Come on, don't tell me you've not had a good revenge <laughs> fuck. The enemy. Yeah, okay. I, I, uh, when you put un- it like Underrated. <laughs> okay. Um, look, I might come in with a bit of stick there or that anyway. Um... Where are we up to? Who is our favourite Arsenal moment? And this is obviously the Invincibles was thereabouts, but I, I I can't look at look that season was don't get me wrong I've looked it back on it at YouTube, but living abroad we once again we didn't have Foxtel, so we we didn't watch every game of that season. You know you'd read about it in the paper, you'd hear about it, and oh, Arsenal, uh, you know win again and we're going through in you know this and that and a mate of mine was actually an Arsenal fan and at the time and I'd go around to his place and watch the games and and we'd sit up on the couch at that you know two o'clock in the morning but but he lived an hour from me so it was a, it was a big commitment as well so um, mm. it was one of them seasons for me that I did read a lot about I followed through top of the on the internet and at the time and uh, through newspapers and things so it was, it was it was a hard one. Um, you? Um, I, I agree with you. I mean, the, the the coverage of the Invincible season was nowhere near where it should have been here because I, I don't think it was ever put in perspective um, for someone like me, at least, who was, what, 10 years old at that point, what this truly meant. You know, it, Maybe it was just my age and my immaturity back then that I, I didn't quite understand the, the scope of what we had achieved. But for me, when you ask me my favorite Arsenal moment, I, I sense that you're trying to se- get a sense of what what made well, like what moment for me encapsulates our club and why I love this club the most. And for me, that is when we gave Arsene Wenger the invincible trophy as he was departing. I think that, in a nutshell, captures the club very well. There's there's a history of how we've treated our staff, our employees, everyone that works at the club from, from down up. Uh, there's a touch of class that comes with bestowing upon him the greatest achievement that European football has arguably seen in the last hundred years. And uh, there, there's, there's tradition of, 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 of a winning spirit of, of achieving the impossible that our Arson sort of instilled into the club and, and reinvigorated with the club that is all encapsulated in that moment. You know, we showed true class, we showed true rigor f- to our manager who obviously uh, didn't have the sweetest of endings, but we, endings with the club, but we, but we made sure that as he departs and embarks on his future adventure, we do everything we can and give him the proper send off. And to me, that is my favorite Arsenal moment. It made me tear up. Uh, I don't think I felt like that ever. I was glued to the TV as, as the events were transpiring on that day. And I don't think I've ever felt the way I felt that day uh, ever again in my life, or even before that, for that matter. So for me, it has to be that, that particular moment etched in my memory. For me, I, 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 I'm a big tough bloke, and I, I don't shed a tear much. Um, Arsene Wenger was copping a, a lot of fucking shit. Uh, 2004, I think, was our last trophy at the time. Uh, it could be standard correct there, actually. But, but 2014, the FA Cup. Mm. When we won the FA Cup, I thought, fuck you. Like, that was just, that for me, I, 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 I did shed a tear. I was like, fucking look at him. He's up there and he's holding that FA Cup proud as punch. And, and at the time, he'd been copping a lot of slack. And 
all these fan channels were popping up left, right and centre and, and, you know, it was all the talk on social media was was some bloke take, you know, went Wenger out and, and this and that and it was for so many years and, and then he won a trophy and I was just so, I was so proud on the 2014 FA Cup. That was a that was a brilliant, brilliant moment as well. I mean, just, just, I mean, and there's moments like that scattered throughout our history, aren't they? I mean, even if we don't look too far back in the past and look at the the win against Chelsea uh, in the FA Cup final, uh, the win against Barcelona, of course, in the Champions League when Jack Wilshere had a a magical night. You know, th- there's nights like that scattered throughout. Even um, Henri's goals at, at the San Siro. Um, you know, there's so many of those. Andre at the Bernabeu again, just just left everyone in the dust as he as he saw his only goal, which was the goal. So there's moments like that throughout. But I think there's a reason that my favorite moment occurred outside the pitch, and I think that's a testament to the club and how you know how we define our mo. I don't know if we've answered this one before, but. Um... How did you come on to the Clock and Talk podcast? Ooh, lovely. Time to finally set the record straight from all the nonsense that, that everyone has been told. So the story goes that I apparently begged to come on to the show. Apparently that's something that happened that I'm unaware of. Uh, truth be told, Tony and Tez were sick of Carl and Savvy. And they reached out to me <laughs> that we want, you on, we want you to be on the show. And we don't want to just kick those boys out, so we'll slowly embed you and then get them out one by one. So that's how I came to be on the Clock and Talk podcast. That's just my two cents. Tony and Tez may disagree, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> we'll be able to throw you under the bus. <laughs> Tony be listening back to this guy. Fuck this guy. He's throwing us straight under the bus. Um, uh, I'm, no, no Go on, com- I'm not going to comment on, on your on how you got here. I'm not going to deny or <laughs> anything. I'm just going to let that one roll. Um, how, did, how did I come on to the clock and talk? I, I think I've probably said it before. Um, I mean, Tony, uh, we, we started off as a blog. Tony was actually doing audio, and I and uh, so it was clock and talk blog, and I'm not much of a writer myself, so I was like, fuck, I don't really want to write. Like, I'm happy to, I'm a good organiser, and I can organise shit, but I'm hopeless at, I, I'm not going to sit there and write fucking article after article. So Tony was the same. He said, mate, I'm not doing writing. I'm happy to do audio. So he was doing audio snippets, telling little stories, and we're putting them up on, I think it was Audio Mac, and I couldn't believe we were getting actually lots of listens um, to the stories. I was like, fuck, that's pretty cool. And then the Twitter type of went through the roof and four or 5,000 followers, and, and um, I said to Tony, I said, well, let's start a podcast. So we kicked off a podcast, and here we are going into third season next year yeah and for anyone who is not well acquainted with the short stories that tony did long before the podcast came out um you know he's done these four minute five minute snippets on what exactly happened behind the scenes uh, that led to the the nasri transfer the cess fabregas transfer even i think he's done one on van persie and uh, I would highly encourage you guys to go onto YouTube and just ser- search for them somewhere on our, our YouTube page because they're well worth a listen. Yeah, I've put them in a little playlist, so they're all up top of the page on YouTube. So Actually, and that's that just, you brought up an interesting thing there with the stories because he actually said to me, I've ran out of stories. <laughs> I said, what are you going to do now? And that's that's when we said, well, let's do a podcast. So. Mm. Um Okay, uh, what was the best moment you've ever had on the Clock and Talk podcast in two seasons? Oh, easy. When I said that Alexis Sanchez is going to win the Golden Boot, <laughs> 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 I think that was that was that was that's when I peaked, and ever since it's been downhill. <laughs> that's the come. That just cracks me up. <laughs> I just yeah, fucking hell. Um, What's for- yours? Look, one of the I, many times you had a wank over Granit somewhere? Uh, no, nah, look, I, I've actually enjoyed talking to um, a couple of guests. Uh, mm. a, a couple of guests that be, have been really good and just sitting back listening to to them. And I, I can't, mate, I've got a hopeless memory, so I can't even think of the guests that we had on. Uh, Kevin Campbell was one. Uh, Graham Stack. Graham Stack, he, he was really good. Um 
and then I had a chat with um, who's that bloke that writes all writes for the is it the Mirror? John Cross. Yeah, fuck me. Not yeah, that's him. <laughs> yeah, so so things like that. That was that's always been good, and it's it's just great to sit back and listen to the knowledge that they that they come out with, and and uh, you know, and, and there's been plenty of times where there's been fun times that I've had. To, you know, we've all taken the piss out on each other, and the one thing I really like about it all is there's no, there's no, you know, it's it's, it's been never no con- big control or or it's my podcast or it's or it's this and that. It's just like you know, we're you know, it's like we all just take the piss out on each other, and it's just a fun atmosphere. And and then we get on the podcast. It's like just talking to a couple of blokes at the pub and just talking about Arsenal and uh, every week I sit there and I think this is cool <laughs> yeah just so it, yeah I haven't got an exact moment but yeah just 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 enjoy it as it is I suppose yeah I, I think that that thing as you said in entirety answers the next question for me which is why do I do this podcast and before I give my response I'll, I'll let you have at it um, yeah, look, as I just said, it's, it's like sitting back talking to a few blokes at the pub, talking about the game. Sometimes you get on here and you think, you're fucking dirty, you know, Mustafi, you useless <laughs> cunt, or you're fucking filthy at fucking Abamyang for missing the goal, and, and you're, you're sitting here and it's, you know, you're watching the game, it's two o'clock in the morning, and you're fucking cursing at the TV, and some cunt's fucking warning you up outside, and you feel like going out and flogging that cunt because he's telling you to shut up. And all you're thinking is, fuck, we've lost the top four. <laughs> and, and then you get on here and you talk to you boys and, you know, we, we, we don't really talk much after the game, do we? We type of save it up for the podcast, but, you know, we've, we've had 24 hours to cool down and we jump on and it just gets everything off your chest because you boys can relate and we can all relate to each other on the performance and how the game's gone. Absolutely. I mean... Um, for for anyone listening and who obviously doesn't know how we set up our our show, how we plan it, you know, it's it's not as if it's not a big deal. We never have a script. It's uh, we have a you know a semi format if you want to call it that. We know Tez will come in and do his job. We know what Tony will say. We know what sort of I'll say, and we just come and have a chat. And you know, I, I'd say that the two hours or the hour and a half that we record is nowhere as entertaining as what we talk about before or after the show and. I think that for me is the culmination of why I do any podcast. You know, I've met these two boys. I've had the uh, the pleasure of meeting Tony in person when I was in the UK, and we had a, a fun time despite him not shedding any money out. Uh, you know, contrary to popular opinion, and I've o- obviously met and met, you know made friends with other people. You know, Darren, of course, the Delhi Gooner, who I've done a few shows with. He was on our show not too long ago. Uh, he's someone I've connected with, and uh, he got me a ticket to the Man United game when I was in the UK. So these relationships that that have formed, uh, not just the indirect ones, but also the direct ones, have, uh, you know, they 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 are special. You know, I've, a lot of these people I'd never met in my life, and uh, Tez, I still haven't, and it seems like I know the guy for for the longest time. We know exactly how we think because we talk so often. So it, it's this is not an Arsenal podcast. This is just guys getting together, as you said, Tez, at the pub or elsewhere, and just having a chat. And it just so happens that the recorded bit is only Arsenal, but we chat about other things as well. Yeah, ex- exactly. And um, <laughs> I tried talking F1 with Tony last night about Monaco Grand Prix, but uh, not interested. <laughs> yep, that's a dead end, if I've ever seen one. <laughs> dead end, all right. Um, yeah, he look, once told me he'll talk about icebergs melting over the Monaco Grand Prix. I, I believe him. <laughs> <laughs> he probably would. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's... Uh, sorry, I am blinking out here. Um, yeah, so that's basically what it is, you know. It's... It's, I, I, as I said in the opening, you know, we've got over 100,000 downloads and, and that's not counting Spotify and YouTube. And I, I am absolutely blown away in two seasons, you know, 50,000 a, a season consistently. And uh, I just, we're obviously doing something right. We, there is no format to the show. I don't plan anything. I am absolutely hopeless at planning stuff. If I plan stuff, it'll go to shit. Um, so it's literally off the cuff. Some nights I'm recording here, you know, at, at midnight, one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, the brain's not thinking. I'm sitting back going, oh, fuck, I don't know what <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's, we just do it and I, we enjoy doing it. So. 
Um, okay, now we'll get into a couple of Arsenal stuff here. So Arsenal's best signing for you ever. Ooh, ever. Are, are we talking pound for pound? Are we are we talking just in terms of impact? I mean, there, there's so many different ways of answering this. Look, and it's so hard because I, I was looking back through it, a lot of Arsenal signings and whatnot, you know, and, and Ian Wright before my days in 1991 from Crystal Palace for... For two point mm. five million pound, I don't know what two point five million pound is in today's dollar. So, is that obviously a great signing? But in today's money, what would that be, uh, Tony? Be- Maybe to multiply it by ten. I'd say that's a decent way of estimating today's inflation. Yeah. So, so you know, and and it's so hard, like. Well, I, I talked about Sol Campbell's loyalty, but fuck me, it's it's hard to go past him as a good signing. <laughs> yeah, on a free, very very hard to argue. Um, Henri, I mean Burke Camp. That's the thing, though. Isn't it? I mean Tony Adams was was of course Mister Arsenal. He's been a part of the system. One could argue that was a very astute signing way before you know uh, the player became a senior player. So it's 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 really hard to contextualize that. I mean Aaron Ramsey, pound for pound. For much amount, amount of money we spent on him, he's been great. Laurent Koscielny falls into that bracket as well. Uh, Cesc Fabregas, not to mention, obviously, is uh, a major contender. One but I think I'll go... From Barcelona in 2003. Boy, exactly. Fucking... And, and, the, and, the, and the output we got from him, right? Yeah. Forget that he went back. Just forget that for a second. And just while he was there, the, sh- the shoes he had to fill were not small ones. But he, he did a fantastic job. I, I think Andre, bloody what uh, ten point five million from you, right? Nine oh ninety nine. Nicholas Anelka, how good was he for us uh, before we we let him leave? Uh, because you know, obviously, we had a ready made replacement who was going to tear the league up. But still, Anelka was was brilliant while he was at the Arsenal. Kanu was brilliant. How good was he? That that hat trick at Stamford Bridge is one of the most iconic hat tricks ever ever scored. Just, so it's, just quickly, and I don't want to backtrack too much here, but we're talking about Arsenal's best signing. So, so look, obviously it's very hard to... It is a very hard question, and I did throw in there. Um, but then I'm looking at... We were talking about disliked players, and we were talking about Tony and his, and his little clips that he does. Have you heard the one with Nasri? I have. I have never disliked him after listening okay. to that. Yep. It humbled me because... You know, Nasri's obviously notoriously known for, for partying, for having that over-the-top lifestyle, which, for the record, he's absolutely entitled to as long as he performs on the pitch and turns up for training. But having heard what Tony had to say about that, and of course Tony's sources, I would say, are very, very accurate when it comes to this, is that the man really had no, no bad role to play. He was ambitious, and that was what led for him to leave the club. So that's why I was saying that people should listen to those recordings because even if you don't believe them word for word, it gives you some perspective and it helps you, you know, think about future things in different scenarios. So it just opens, you know, like uh, cognitive corridors, I suppose, in your brain to try and form a more accurate image of what actually happened. We got best signing, but we're, it's so many we're not going to be able to nail one down. Who was the worst? I, I, I have one. You I have go. one. Yeah. Arsene Wenger. Oh, yeah. Hard to disagree with that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Very hard to disagree with that. <laughs> Good shout. Good shout. <laughs> <laughs> um, who was the worst Sony? Mustafi. Let's move on. Mustafi. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a few, though, to be fair. I, I'm going to throw in Javinho, 2011. Mm. And only because I had to fucking deal with him at Roma. <laughs> so I had to deal with the guy twice. <laughs> so funny. That's the only reason I'm throwing him there. But it, but it was a shit signing. <laughs> okay, I, I, there's no way I can top that. We should just move on. <laughs> um, what do we got? Were you a Wenger, Wenger in or Wenger out? Oh come on! No one needs to know my answer to this question. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, well, we're all Wenger in. <laughs> if you were in charge of the summer transfer and you had a hundred million dollars to spend this season, oh boy, who, oh boy, who would you buy? Okay, this is a bit tough. So let's do it this way: I'll say a player's name, and you tell me how much he's going to cost. And when you say players' names, I'll tell you how much they cost, just to mediate how we get to a hundred mil. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So assuming there are no outs, 
um, and we have this quad and we're only going to make addition, I would say I would buy a left back. Uh, I would buy a center back and I would buy a center mid. I'd spend maybe 40 million on a center back. I'd maybe spend about 30 million, maybe 35 million on a center mid and the remaining on a left back. I'm not going to throw names out there. I think it's very hard the more I think about it um, because we're looking in, in such different markets to what we've usually looked into. I feel that it's very difficult for me to to speculate. But maybe as Tez, you're saying out names, some will pop up in my mind as well. Well, for me, it's... it's and, and, and some people are going to say no. Some people are going to say yes because I've, I've read a bit on Twitter. It's a bit of a mixed bag. I, I really like Zaha. Mm. Um, I, I, for me, I think he's... It's what Arsenal's missing. I think he'd get the best out of a Lacazette. He'd get even better out of a Bamiyang. And and I, what are we thinking? What what is it? Fifty mil or something? Was it? Yeah, fifty sixty would be my guess. I think I think it needs to be done. You don't don't you think we're left a bit thin um, in other departments then? Um, that's that's my only problem with a hundred mil. Mm. Left back is a definite. Yeah, more, right, more, than a, right. more than a center back? Look, and I know, <laughs> this is hard, but you've only got 100 mil. I don't know what Arsenal's got. But a center back, people are going to say yes. Yes, our defense was shonked this, this, this season, right? But we mm. got fifth. Mustafi, as much as he has Mustafi moments, he, he does do the job and can do the job. It's not going to happen overnight and for me I, I've been thinking about this I think we're better off outscoring our oppositions so it, is, does that mean that you're saying if Mustafi stays you're okay with us not going into the market for a centre back yeah yeah, yeah look I, I think I mean I, I don't disagree with you I think he has his moments and they're the ones that stand out and that makes us not really appreciate the good things he does but at the same time, I think he's so calamitous and errors that, that happen in those positions where he plays are often suicidal. So it, it's, it's, it's a professional hazard in that, that regard, but I just don't think he's nearly consistent enough, nor do I think he's really good enough to, to play for the club at this level. And I understand your point that we should just outscore opponents, but if we had a good defense this season, I think one could easily argue that we'd finish top four. A few, a few positive results away from home at lesser opposition would have really put us in, in you know in, in the reckoning up there. Look, I'm just thinking practical. Now when you think of Liverpool, they spent a lot of money on defence. Van Dijk, what, seventy mil? Um, Manchester City spent a lot of money on defence. Uh, Manchester United probably struggled a bit defensively. Um, Chelsea struggled a little bit attack. Mm, yeah. They, they've got the defence type of sorted. Arsenal, we probably more likely, we, we do struggle on defence. Now, if you're actually going to go out in the market for a centre back, now, uh, Kula Bali, uh, you know, uh, I don't want uh, anyone from Roma. <laughs> I just don't want, want him. Um, but, but you're thinking, defend, I'm thinking 60 mil. I'm not thinking a 20 or 30 million dollar centre back. We've got Rob mm. Holding there, who's going to become... He's going to come back fit next season. We've got... I know this bloke, you know, young Mafropanus, but, but they type of... He didn't really get much of a go, and we don't know much too about him, but I think between Rob Holding, Mafropanus, Mustafi... Um, who else is there? Socrates. Socrates, Kashani, if, if he stays. Um, I think it's enough. I, I would rather spend... Spend all my, you know, definitely a left back, definitely a left back, and definitely a, a, a winger. And if we can, we spend fifty million on both positions, and then maybe next summer we go, okay, now let's spend another fifty million on the centre back. I don't want a band aid centre back for twenty mil. No, I hundred I mean, percent agree with that, and I've always said that, but. I think there's a few real factors we have to consider as well. Uh, I mean, I know this is an academic exercise, but I think amongst the central defenders you named, I don't think Mavropanos is anywhere in, in the pecking order at the top. 
I think he still needs time. You've said it before that he needs a loan. I completely agree. I think Mustafi is off. Uh, I think he'll he'll be gone for sure. I'm pretty sure Koscielny will leave as well. And that only leaves us with the three, plus Callum Chambers returning. I think a center back will be priority one. I think a center mid will be priority number two because we're going to lose Ramsey. Uh, I can easily see us getting rid of Granit Xhaka because he's the only one who's going to generate any sort of revenue. And I also don't think Emery is going to necessarily stick with him. I could see that happening. It may not, but I could see it happening. Yeah, and probably. then I would say, and then I would say is a, a shared priority between a winger and a left back. I would say that I, I know Montreal's contract is 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 in the up in the air, but I could see us extending him by a year, uh, showing some more faith in Kolasinac, maybe giving him another year to to cope up with the league and see if he can really cut the mustard. And then maybe looking at a left back next season, just because of how stretched with and uh, you know how thin we're stretched when What's it comes it to our funds. When you're not your sign, Monreal's stay. I'm I'm saying there's a possibility we might extend. I'm sure Emery wants another left back, but because of our funds, I think we might have to extend him and then look at a left back next window. Okay. okay. Because also uh, you think in. Um Mind blank. Oh, total mind blank not talking about Arsenal for a couple of weeks. Um, no, nah, it's, it's lost me. I forgot. Sorry. Uh, he plays right back. Maitland uh, Niles. Maitland Niles. Sorry. Yeah. Bellerin, <laughs> Maitland Niles. I, I, and then you got Chambers. That's what I was, I was thinking. Like, who else? You know, and he can fill the position. So Chambers could play as a centre back. And a centre mid. And a centre mid. You've got Maitland-Niles is right back. You've got Bellerin there as well. I, I just, I, I see the point, but I think this is my problem with Arsenal is we seem to be going for these mediocre players that are never going to reach superstar level. I, I think that that has been true for the past, uh, particularly when we were you know, uh, undergoing some financial austerity to try and pay, to, uh, pay back some of our debt. I think now the focus will be on value. I don't think we will buy the A-grade players, you know, superstars as they are. I think we're going to look for potential uh, across South America, maybe in Europe, the way we have with Matteo Guendouzi and Lucas Torreira, and try and make players out of them. The, the, the so-called Liverpool model, I think they've done this pretty well, where they've capitalized on these cheap signings and then made you know, quite a bit of money by selling them, and well, then hence been able to... Well, that's where, I, that's where I think Holding and Mafrapana, somebody's looked at them previously and gone, they're the two blokes of the future. Yeah, but the, perhaps, but not next year future, maybe okay. three years down the line future. Yep, okay. Yeah, as a pairing. Yeah, yeah. Holding is ready, as we've seen, yep. but still is Holding someone who can marshal the defence. It's one thing for Holding to play next to Socrates, who is allowing him and giving him directions on how to go on, but... Holding in Mabropanos, that, that means Holding's the one calling the shots there, mm. in all probability. And I'm not quite sure if Rob is ready for it. I've said it before, I think he is, he has, you know, he has shades of Tony Adams about him. I really do feel so. And not just in terms of mentality, but even the way he plays, the way he reads the game, the way he plays mind games. You know, he didn't let someone like Diego Costa uh, face him at all. I think he has that in him. But to throw him into the deep end right away might be doing more bad than good. Okay, where do you see Arsenal in five years? Whew, I, I want to be so optimistic. I really do. Uh, and that doesn't mean I'm going to be negative here. I think, I think the structure is there. I've, of course, defended KSC and, and the model that we've used uh, quite a bit in the last year or two. So I, I want to believe that they have the right intentions. There's no reason for them not to, as explained financially many times before. Uh, my, my only doubt or the only you know question i have is what do they really define as true success you know you don't you don't make money without spending money that's a very universal saying and it's apl applicable to football and i'm not saying the ksc has to spend their own money but it will be a you know a demarcator for what truly their ambition is uh, are they okay with premier league top 4 throughout or, or are they going to really challenge is it going to be cyclical is it going to be a while before we reach that point where KSC is like, okay, we see something here, we're going to throw money at it? Or is it ever going to be a Chelsea model where they just keep throwing money? Will it ever be that to try and achieve success and, and save their asset? 
So I, I think the future is bright and it's very, very glass half full. Uh, I could easily see someone arguing it's not going to be bright because Emery's first season hasn't been the brightest uh, in terms of the football, at least. So it's a difficult one, but I'll, I'll end this one on a, on a positive note. I, I, look, I agree with everything you said there. However, I, look, for me, I think Arsenal fans have got their expectations mixed up with the capabilities this season. I, I, I really think, like... You said fifth. I think I, I I went all out and said fourth because I always like to see Arsenal at least get in fourth or challenge for fourth. Uh, Tony was around the fourth or fifth mark. None of us said, nobody said Arsenal's going to get first, second or third. Wait, did you not say they were going to finish third? I might have said third. <laughs> I, might yeah. have, I just think I might have said third. But only because I want them, I want to dust the beat Tottenham and I, I was... It, was, it wasn't my expectations. It was what I said, but it, I wasn't thinking, oh, I'm not disappointed if we got fourth or fifth. But, mm. so, so based on Emery's season this season, I, I think we can all say that's what we, we expected. Yes, OK, we should have got top four. Yes, there was games we should have won that cost us a top four. But, hey, this was always going to be a tough year in his first year. So... Next year, I like to see a little bit more. Next year, I will really be wanting fourth, third or fourth. If he hasn't got a third or fourth next year, we have gone below my expectations for Arsenal and Emery. Looking at, the, looking at five years down the track, I would like to think next year we secure Champions League. If not this year, I would love it. For, you know, we've still got a final to play, and I would love him to secure Champions League this year. But... Mm. My priority next season is to secure Champions League in the Premier League, third or fourth. Then we've got something to. Then he's got something to build on. If it happens this year, well, it happens this year, and he starts building um, and looking five years down the track. Do I see us winning a, a Premier League trophy in five years? No, not really. Uh, my expectation. Do you see us challenging for a Premier League trophy? I look. Let's. I don't think I do. No, Manchester and Manchester City and Liverpool are so far in advance at the moment. They are like they just they just. I'm talking um, five years. Look, maybe the fourth or fifth year. I would like to think we're thereabouts. You know, mm. we're, we're equal with them in the in that fourth or fifth year. But I'm not thinking the next three years at at all. Um. I would like to think in the fourth or fifth year we're actually are challenging and we've actually caught up to them because we've been so far behind. You know, player wages. You know, we got rid of the the uh, you know Jack Wilshere left, Walcott left. Um, there's still players that are that are hammering down us with these wages who who don't do anything. What's the fucking old mate's name? Bloody uh, who runs around in that fucking dinosaur suit, Jenko. You know, players like them, I just we need a clean out. We need to clean these blokes out. And then, and I, this is what I want to see in the next two to three years, is, is cleaning these players out, bringing these young, whoever they are, like whoever the scout is or whatnot, bringing these young players in who, a little bit like Roma are doing now, you know, with under and, and uh, different players there that all of a sudden are, are sparking interest. But... The, the biggest thing for me at Arsenal, I don't, I don't want our club to be one of them clubs that buy a player for $10 million and turn them over in two years' time for $60 million. Because but I, I think that's a bit... Compete. I think that's a bit unrealistic uh, in, in today's world especially. I mean, you, know, you could land up with talent... You could land up, with, you know, land up with amazing talent in two players that play the same position. You know, and that's sort of what's going on with us right now. Or you could land up with a talent, someone like Mesut Ozil, who of course has been underperforming, but let's assume Mesut Ozil was doing really well, but it, he just didn't seem to fit the Emery mold because he couldn't press if Emery does indeed want to play pressing football. So uh, also, I mean, the biggest thing for me from what you said is that you see all, the next five years as very linear. You see us only progressing or digressing at some point, right? I think they could be dynamic. I think we could do very well next season but then suddenly go off a cliff the season after. You know, football is so, so different, and uh, the, the cycle in football is so sh short, time passes so quickly, 
that I don't necessarily think the graph is going to be consistent one way or the other. We could end up having a bad season next season and then ending up firing Emery and getting someone who can somehow turn the squad we have to, you know, make us do good things the season after that. So it's it's very, very difficult to speculate. I suppose a better question, a more pointed question would be, how many trophies do you see us getting? Major trophies, Champions League and Premier League only in the next five years? Well, I'd, lo- I'd like to think at least, for, in five years, at least an FA Cup there somewhere. Okay. I, I, I What's the energy energy drink? I, Carab- Carabao. I'm not really bothered by it. Okay. Um, if we win it, we win it. But mm. definitely an FA Cup there in the next five years. I, I, I'm sure, look, if that's our goal, if we're in Champions League, I want to at least, I've got to be realistic, I want to be competing in Champions League. I want through the group stage. I want uh, I want Arsenal to be. We are, you know, we're a big team. We're we we're, we're in London. We're, we've got plenty of appeal. We're not we're not a we're not a Southampton. We're not an Everton. We're, this is the Arsenal we're talking about. I, I you know like compete in Champions League football. I don't. I'm not worried. I would love if we won a Champions League trophy. Do I see it realistically? No, I don't. In the next five years, hey, I'll take it if it, if it, if we get there. But Ajax this season, everybody mm. looked at them and went, "Wow, <laughs> wow!" Like that's that's a win for me. If an Arsenal mm. can do that, I'm like, "Wow, yeah, that's our club." <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Very well said. I mean. There's nothing better than generating 100 million pounds worth of talent on your own or buying them really young like they did with Frankie de Jong and, you know, having the, the foresight to understand that, yes, this kid has something about him. And, you know, whether that's through the academy or you bring them at, in at a young age and, and see them bloom. And then, you know, whether it's a, a financial decision to get rid of them or it's just an opportunity you see elsewhere. That, that I mean, I'd say that Southampton is probably a great club to be like, you know. When I was watching Barcelona play Liverpool the other day, I think it, it was, in the Champions League, I couldn't believe how many Southampton players were, were on, on display. I think it was that game. And it just made me think about how how well they've done. Yeah, and not just with their players, but with their managers. I mean, Pochettino, of course, came from there. And, uh, you know, Puel did a, a decent stint there as well. I mean, they've they've... they've Really done well, I'd say. Yeah, when you put it like that, yeah, they um, they have, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Okay. Um, look, one last question. It's not really a question, but but uh, finish the sentence. Arsenal is. Ooh. Uh, go on, then give me a second to think. <laughs> Arsenal is at the moment a club. I don't want to ever say rebuilding because. I, I don't, oh, and I think I have said it, but I've changed my mind, <laughs> if I'm allowed. <laughs> because I was thinking about this the other day. Arsenal, you do not come in, a manager cannot come into a team and go, this is my rebuilding year. That is a load of shit. And I hear a lot of Arsenal fans saying it. We're rebuilding, we're rebuilding, we're rebuilding. You want to, that manager and them players, they ain't thinking rebuilding. They are coming to win trophies. They are, they are doing the damnedest they can to win the fucking Premier League, although mm-hmm. we, we were a long way off. So I don't ever want I don't want to put us as a rebuilding club. For me, Arsenal's a, a worldwide club. Um, mm-hmm. We have fans around the world. We have people talking podcasts. We have I think that's the biggest number of bloggers in a club is probably with Arsenal because you see blog after blog after blog. The conversations that are met by Arsenal, for me, Arsenal is it's it's true to my heart. And um, oh, look, I enjoy talking about them all the time. And uh, without Arsenal, we'd probably be, I don't know, talking fucking shit. I don't know. Who knows what we're fucking doing? But but like, yeah. So uh, it's a it is a tough one. <laughs> Yeah, because it, it, that's exactly right. I mean, as you were saying, I was thinking of something, you know, to, to describe Arsenal as. And it's, it's so difficult. I think the only thing that comes to me, uh, strangely, is that to me, Arsenal is almost like a human being. You know, the, the interaction I have with Arsenal, whether it's through Twitter, whether it's through friends, whether it's doing a podcast. You know, to me, 
Arsenal is like another individual in my life. The amount of time my brain gives to thinking about Arsenal, to talking about Arsenal, to engaging on the topic. You know, it's it, it's a it's a definite part of life that will never leave me. And I think that probably reverberates across everyone listening, everyone that has, you know, love and support for the club. It's it, it's it's an attachment that is universally immortal and you don't give it up. Uh, for anything, you know, I know a lot of people who schedule their travel based on fixtures. Uh, I know people like Tony, for example, who goes to games and you know will try and do everything possible, like he did the other day, trying you know spending hours to look for flights, for accommodation, doing his visas, just to go watch Arsenal and the the possibility of you know us winning glory. That is not normal behavior, you know. You do that for human beings. You don't do that for things uh, in your life. And the fact that people do on a week in, week out basis with their families, you know, with the financial burden that comes with it, with the emotional burden that's come that's come with it for the last 10, 15 years, it's it's it, I, I have no other explanation for it. I don't see humans doing that for anything else other than for humans. So Arsenal is a human being to me, weirdly enough. It's just as you're th- you're saying that, I was thinking Arsenal is a marriage. And that, yeah. <laughs> we 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 love them one day and we hate them the next. <laughs> yeah, we'll always lo- we may not like them, but we'll always love them. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, um, look, that's that's all we got time for. Um, hopefully, we give you a bit of our insight on how we think, and you know a bit more about us. Um, Tony Tony will pop up, so we'll come back. Uh, he's in Baku. We're going to pop back probably Sunday or something. He said three days after the final, he'll be back in London or wherever he, wherever he fucking lives. Um, so we're going to do a podcast on the final, and then after that, we we might do a we'll, we'll get Tony's views on those same questions. Should we? Yeah, and uh, for everyone listening, if there is any question that you wanted us to answer about ourselves or about how we interacted or got to know each other uh, that you thought we missed out on. Then make sure you let us know so that when Tony comes around, then Tez, Tez has a you know chance of asking him him at least those questions, and you guys getting a bit more insight into our dull lives. Okay, thanks, Mike. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Uh, it's been a while, so I apologize, but it, this was great. I'm glad we did this. Yeah, awesome, great stuff, and uh, thank you everybody out there for your support, and thank you for listening and downloading, and you can follow us on Twitter at clockend underscore talk. Um, you can yeah everywhere i just i've never mentioned it much just if you're on twitter or facebook or something we actually have a whatsapp group going which is uh to, for our dedicated listeners and we have a bit of a yak in there and chin wag and whatnot to a few of the lads so it's a secret group if you want to be involved in that just flick us a dm and i'll um i'll, I'll get you involved in that as well so okay excellent we'll speak to you all Love all you lovely people when the after the final and uh, come on you Arsenal and fucking fuck these Chelsea cunts up. Thank you. Thank you.